Uh, this lecture will focus on unfree labor, which is often referred to as forced labor, human trafficking, and modern slavery in global supply chains. Unfree labor in global supply chains is often to considered to be a very modern problem, something that's been caused uh, beginning in the 1990s by processes of globalization that have made supply chains both more international as well as more complex. Today, we'll discuss how unfree labor in global supply chains uh, is actually a much older problem that both reflects and re ingrains wealth inequalities and transfers shaped by historical colonial relationships. The first part of the lecture will focus on how unfree labor tends to be understood and the social movement that has emerged to seek to combat it, as well as some of the pitfalls of these approaches. In the second part of the lecture, I'll argue that there's a tendency to gloss over the historic and ongoing dynamics of colonial capitalism in predictably giving rise to unfree labor in supply chains, including dynamics of dispossession and expropriation, colonial histories of unfree labor, and how these continue to shape the lives of contemporary workers and communities, and the role of wealthy states and corporations in engineering global supply chains that yield unequal wealth and value distribution, many of which were actually forged in colonial eras. Finally, at the end, I'll briefly illustrate these dynamics through an example of the global tea supply chain. The concept of unfree labor seeks to capture the full range of coerced labor relations that exist in the capitalist global economy. In both scholarship and in the real world, uh, unfree labor is typically referred to as human trafficking, modern slavery, or forced labor. The standard legal definition of forced labor comes from the International Labor Organization, uh, which defined it in the 1930 Forced Labor Convention as all work or service which is exacted under the menace of any penalty for its non-performance and for which the worker does not offer himself vo voluntarily. This designation includes human trafficking for the purpose of exploitation, debt bondage, serfdom, and slavery. To fall into this ILO definition, a victim must be working involuntarily and facing coercion that precludes their exit from the labor situation, uh, which might include physical, financial, or psychological coercion. According to the ILO's definition of forced labor, uh, forced labor is work that uh, people are forced to do against their will under some form of coercion, to put it in a nutshell. Modern slavery is a more slippery term that tends to be inconsistently defined uh, within policy debates, and I'll come back to that definition of modern slavery in a moment. For now, the important point to make is that a lot of political economy theory and scholarship has long assumed that these forms of coerced labor, whether they call them unfree labor or forced labor, are incompatible with capitalism. Both neoclassical economists as well as veins of Marxist theory have maintained that capitalism will replace unfree labor with free wage labor as markets deepened and extended around the world. But it's clear now that the deepening and extension of capitalism over recent decades has not diminished unfree labor. If anything, it's reinforced or perhaps even accelerated on free labor within certain industries and parts of the world. Unfortunately, we still don't have accurate time series data to begin to meaningfully evaluate how forced labor has changed over time. But what we do know to, is that today, various forms of unfree labor are an endemic part of the production of a wide range of goods, including gold, tea, coffee, and cocoa, palm oil, electronics, shrimp, nuts, sugar, rubber, cotton, metals, meats, garments, and footwear. Unfree labor also thrives in the service sector, uh, as well as in hotels, cleaning, domestic labor, and many other forms of work. Unfree labor takes place in every country in the world, including countries like the United Kingdom, United States, and Canada, which are often described as advanced capitalist countries. As awareness of the problem has grown over the last two decades, fighting modern slavery and human trafficking has become a very popular cause. Policies to combat modern slavery are championed by both right and left-wing governments around the world. Multinational corporations have warmly embraced 
this cause, hosting panels on fighting modern slavery at the World Economic Forum, at rock music festivals, and a civil society coalition has banded together, uh, claiming to eradicate slavery with an arsenal ranging from slave raids to awareness raising campaigns. There's a growing and important academic literature on the colonial and racial dynamics of anti-trafficking and anti-slavery movements by scholars like Elena Shi, Lindsay Bouton, and Nandita Sharma that I really recommend checking out. And I've included a couple of pieces uh, by these scholars on the reading list uh, for this session. In spite of the huge attention that modern slavery and human trafficking has received from businesses, governments, and civil society, there's been very little discussion of the political economy dynamics of unfree labor. Rather, it tends to be seen as a problem that's caused by criminals, by individual perpetrators. A serious political economy perspective on contemporary unfree labor that is able to connect these practices to colonial capitalism has been lacking, uh, both in real world efforts to combat unfree labor, which typically fail to address root causes, as well as in scholarship. In the typology here on the slide, we lay out some of the key political economic root causes of unfree labor in supply chains, including both the factors that create a predictable supply of workers who are vulnerable to unfree labor, such as poverty, discrimination on the basis of race, gender, and other axes of social difference, limited labor protection, and restrictive mobility regimes as well as the factors that create a stable business demand for unfree labor, including outsourcing, governance gaps, and concentrations of corporate power and ownership. A key limit of dominant approaches to unfree labor is that although a lot of books contain words like economy or globalization in their titles, serious analysis of unfree labor is quite sparse. The political economy analysis uh, that we're presented with often takes the form of a sort of neo-Malthusian anxiety about unchecked population growth and scarce resources or poverty, sometimes vague analysis of globalization. But there's very little discussion of capitalism, nor of the colonial histories and ongoing dynamics of su in supply chains that it is located within. And one reason for this, as I mentioned a moment ago, is that there's a tendency to see the greed and the moral shortcomings of individual perpetrators as the key cause of unfree labor in the global economy today. To see slavery as something that originated in history and it's merely persisted quite passively into the present. In other words, that there's nothing about capitalism that causes unfree labor or gives rise to it. Unfree labor in this dominant paradigm is primarily understood to be driven by individual criminality, cultural backwardness, corruption, and poverty. As author John Bowe put it, unfree labor has less to do with economics than with emotions in the modern slavery paradigm. Brilliant scholars like Elena Shi, Janie Twang, Adele Blackett, Julia O'Connell Davidson, Nandita Sharma, and many others have heavily criticized the modern slavery framing of the problem of unfree labor in the economy today. They've argued, for instance, that the modern slavery approach to understanding unfree labor distorts the political economic nature of the problem, its causes and effective solutions, that it individualizes structural dynamics, that it places causality for contemporary relations of unfreedom in the past, usually in a period that seemed to be pre-capitalist, that it gives cover to anti-immigrant, anti-sex, white saviorism, and misogynistic politics, and that it masks and naturalizes the racial, gendered, and economically unequal fabric of the global economy. To give one example that you'll, uh, you'll encounter in the reading by Bales on the reading list for today, uh, modern slavery scholars have often argued that while in the old slavery, Race was important in shaping who was subjected to enslavement. Today, we have an equal opportunity slavery, wherein anyone of any race or gender has an equal chance of being subjected to unfree labor. And these are the types of claims uh, that scholars have taken issue with from the modern slavery paradigm. And building on this important body of critique, of the modern slavery approach to understanding unfree labor in the economy today. Uh, 
want to argue in this portion of the lecture that these dominant narratives about new slavery also gloss over the historic and ongoing dynamics of colonial capitalism and predictably giving rise to unfree labor in supply chains. These dynamics differ across different types of supply chains and different contexts, but generally they include histories of dispossession and expropriation, colonial histories of unfree labor that continue to shape the lives of contemporary workers and communities, wealthy states and corporations which have engineered global supply chains that yield uh, unequal wealth and value distribution, and that trigger endemic exploitation, uh, violence, and coercion. So to put it briefly, contemporary unfree labor relations in supply chains need to be understood in the context uh, of the legacies and ongoing dynamics of colonial capitalism. I'd like to briefly illustrate this through an example of unfree labor in the global tea supply chain, which comes from my own research. Over the last few years, my research has investigated global business models of forced labor in global tea and cocoa supply chains. And as part of that study, my research team and I did a survey and interviews with around 600 tea workers in two regions of India. We found that forced labor and overlapping forms of labor exploitation continue to be widespread in the tea industry. Every single worker that we interviewed reported some form of labor abuse, including physical violence, sexual violence, threats of violence, threats of dismissal, debt bondage, non and underpayment of wages, and the required to complete unpaid involuntary labor as a condition of their employment. As well, we found that wages were extremely low. Our research found that in spite of working full time, tea workers are taking home on average less than 25% of the poverty line. 54% of the workers that we interviewed had gone into debt and 59% had no savings. The companies that sell the tea that these workers make are highly profitable. To give you a sense of the scale, the world tea market is estimated to be worth around 30 billion pounds annually. And yet, we found unfree labor and extraordinarily low value capture are endemic at the base of the supply chain. These contemporary dynamics are anchored in the colonial history of the global tea supply chain. Historians like Rana Behal at the University of Delhi have done brilliant work on the early development of the tea industry in India under colonial rule and have demonstrated how this history continues to shape contemporary dynamics. Companies like the Assam Company and the British East India Company established tea plantations in Assam in the 1820s and 1830s. In the 1830s, the Wastelands Act allowed large portions of Assam to be transferred, transformed into tea plantations by private companies and military force was deployed by companies to establish these first plantations, fulfilling British demand for tea through extraction, dispossession, and exploitation. Many of our contemporary tea companies actually originated in this era. For example, the Assam Company, which was awarded the Royal Charter by Queen Victoria and founded in 1839, monopolized the cultivation and production of Assam tea through the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. They still trade today as the Assam Company. The global tea supply chain takes the shape that it does today because many of these early tea companies have sold off uh, their tea plantations. They've decided that cultivating tea was nowhere near as profitable as marketing and packaging tea, but they continue to hold power and the lion's share of the profit in tea supply chains. And many of the dynamics that were established by these companies on early plantations persist today. It's important to note that unfree labor was part of the global tea supply chain from its origin. As Rana Bahal of the University of Delhi has described, quote, to preserve their authority, the European planters devised the indenture regime to keep their workforce docile, disciplined, and intimidated, enforced by legislation from the colonial state, thus providing the stamp of legitimacy, end quote. Under this unfree labor regime, in the mid to late 1800s, over a million people were migrated and some forcibly migrated from other parts of the country to establish tea plantations in Assam. Uh, 
The working conditions on these plantations were brutal, as the early European tea companies and planters imported practices that were being used on British-owned slave plantations in the Caribbean and elsewhere. European planters obtained permission from the government within this indentured regime to physically coerce and use violence against tea workers. Uh, for instance, uh, as punishment for low productivity or as retribution for attempted runaways. As well, planters obtained the right to immobilize workers within the confines of the plantation. They had, according to the law, penal rights over their workforce. And as a direct result of this unfree labor system, the Assam tea industry grew rapidly, outpacing China for the first time in 1888 to become the leading exporter of tea. In spite of the global tea market and tea companies having changed in key ways since then, the labor and power dynamics on tea plantations have been remarkably resilient, reinforced by the price pressures exerted by contemporary companies. Today, Assam produces about a sixth of the tea uh, produced worldwide. Uh, but the workers and companies within the Assam tea industry are far from wealthy. In fact, most are struggling to stay afloat because the value produced within the tea supply chain is absorbed by the companies at the top of the chain. One of the things that struck me most in our research in Assam was that almost all of the tea workers we interviewed were part of families who had been moved to the tea plantations through indentured servitude systems under colonial rule. Their contemporary unfreedom articulated in some of the quotes that I've put up on this slide that come from our worker interviews is directly linked to the unfree labor of the past in several different senses. To conclude, historians have done amazing work on the colonial histories of supply chains, but political economists and supply chain scholars in particular have tended to overlook these histories uh, as have dominant approaches to understanding unfree labor. They've tended to see unfree labor in global supply chains as a contemporary issue, uh, the, the roots of which begin in the 90s uh, and, and continue today, the 1990s. But it's really time that we begin to centralize and seek to more deeply understand the colonial roots of unfree labor in global supply chains. As Professor Germander Bambra has argued in her recent article, Colonial Global Economy, which was assigned in another session of this curriculum project, there's a need to, quote, reorient our understandings of the histories that underpin theories of capitalism to be inclusive of colonial relations and for the framework of analysis to be transformed by their appropriate consideration, end quote.